All right, we are on uh, week nine, I believe. And this week, uh, we're going to talk about signal processing in Super Collider. Uh, we have been mostly talking about synthesis, sampling, sequencing, kind of things which are exclusively generative in nature. For the most part, we touched a little bit on filters and things like that. But uh, it, signal processing in this context, we're going to be kind of focusing on effects that tend to be used uh, for lots of different source sounds like reverbs and delays and things like that. And uh, we'll talk about the, the way these kinds of signal chains are implemented and uh, some of the uh, considerations that come into play. So to kick us off, I am going to uh, start with a very simple generative synth def, which plays a tone with a slightly different frequency in each of the two channels. It is uh, it's scaled by a percussive envelope, has an overall amplitude argument, and sends that signal out. And here I'm just picking a random MIDI note number, just so we have something to work with. We'll probably adjust and change this uh, as we go. Uh, so the um, let's say we wanted to put uh, we wanted to modify this sound so that it has like an echo that decays over a period of time. The probably the simplest and maybe the most obvious thing to try is to build the s signal processor which applies the echo directly into this first synth def. Um, and so I'll be introducing just a, maybe a couple of new unit generators here. But um, you know, to, to do that, for example, we might insert a line here, uh, making a new variable in the process. And we are going to use a comb filter. Uh, comb filter is essentially just a delay line with feedback. So we feed it the input signal, which is called SIG. And then we need to provide a maximum delay time, which is just used to allocate an internal buffer. And then the actual delay time, which can be equal to or less than the maximum delay time. And then a decay time, which is a duration in seconds after which the signal will have decayed by 60 decibels. So we'll, we'll just say um, 0 0.2, 0 0.24. So this delay line is capable of producing a delayed uh, a signal with, with a delay time of up to a fifth of a second, and it will take four seconds to decay down by 60 decibels. These, uh, this, these two arguments here can be, you can use arguments here and, and you know, specify them when the synth is called. I'm just hard coding them for now. And then to do something incredibly simple, we can just um, add these two together. Th and there's other ways you can blend and mix two signals. Um, summation is like the simplest, just, just trying to cut out any variables at this point. So we, we create our source sound, we uh, create, we, we basically branch off of that and make a separate container called FX, which contains the delayed signal. We sum them together, scale the amplitude, and send them out. Um, and there is a problem here. So if we, if we listen to what this sounds like, uh huh, let's do it again. It's cut, off. It's cut off early. Why is it cut off early? Yes, because it has an envelope. And this two here is uh, the done action which, which, uh, which frees the synth. So what's happening here is the percussive envelope has an attack of a millisecond and then a release of one second. So this delay effect decays. It takes four seconds to decay down to roughly inaudibility. But the synth that contains it is destroyed after approximately one second. And this is a problem, right? This is the, the inherent problem of trying to bundle uh, time extending effects into uh, the synth depth that also contains the generative material to which the effect is applied. Um, now, there, there are solutions here, and none of them are particularly good. Like if we set the done action to be do nothing, we'll hear the full delay effect. We are going to run into a problem at some point uh, because there is um, nothing in place to actually remove the synth. So they're all 
They're all at the end of their envelope, but each one of these has a comb filter, which is active and working and delaying and things like that. And there is a limit to the number of these that can be dynamically created. If you can try this at home, I'd prefer not to do it here. But uh, you don't have a crazy loud sound or anything like that, but you'll just see the post window kind of blow up and say memory allocation failed, just because these, these comb filters are convenient because they allocate memory space, you know, buffer space in the background. And so it takes the burden off of us, but you know, it's, it's a, so that's, that's the problem you're running into is that we just have all these synths, so I'm gonna hit command period to remove them. And another solution which you can do is, is keep this done action at zero and then just add uh, a line like anywhere uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in the synthesis algorithm and give it done action too. And so now we've created this additional UGen. It's not really connected to anything else. It, you know, it's not doesn't have a name. It's not part of SIG. It's not part of FX, but it exists. And when four seconds have passed, this line will have gone from a value of zero to zero, and then it checks its done action. And so this is going to be the, its its purpose here is just to free the synth after a sufficient amount of time has passed. So this this will work. And then it you know disappears. We'll do it again. Right. Two, three, four, and off it goes. Right. But this is also not great because uh, you know if we then wanted to increase the delay time, we'd have to increase this as well. Or maybe if this sorry the decay time. If we if we increase the decay time, this would have to increase as well. If we decrease this and don't decrease this, then we're just wasting resources because the synth lives on longer than it needs to. So the correct solution is to build two separate synth thefts. We have a, a synth theft that generates the sound that we want to apply a delay to, and then another synth theft whose job it is to input a signal from somewhere so we can basically access the output of the other synth theft, apply the effect, and then spit that out. And that's, that's the general idea, but it, uh, we run into lots of, lots of things along the way that we need to explain. So I'm going to revert to a previous version here. So we'll take away the effects. Uh, we'll take away this, take away this, this, and we're back to our original version. So just pure synthesis, no effects. Uh, all right, so uh, if we, um, w one thing we've been kind of overlooking this whole time is the out unit generator. And I have told you earlier this semester that uh, this UGen or one of its kin has to be in a synth theft if you want it to actually output a signal. If you don't have this, then you can add the synth theft and it just won't make any sound because it hasn't been instructed to output anything. And I've also told you that zero means your left speaker and one means your right speaker. Uh, and uh, that's really just one piece of the puzzle. So I do have an argument here for out. And for simplicity, we'll make this a one-channel signal. So we're just going to take away this multi-channel expansion here, just deleting this. And so now uh, we will open the meters, which we can do with s.meter. And this, this shows us the input and output signals going to and from hardware. So you can see my voice here on the left. And when we play this synth, we can see it's showing up on output zero because that's the default value over here. If we send it to output one, it goes over here. If we send it to output two, we don't see it anywhere, or three, or four, or five. So we, we, these, these meters only show uh, you know, a signal which is um, you know, coming in from hardware or going out to hardware. Um, so let's let's actually open the uh, scope, which is uh, s dot scope. And I'm sure I've showed this in class. Maybe at some point, does this look familiar? S dot scope. Good. So when we play out to zero, one, right, doing its thing. We don't see two because we're only looking at these two, but these numbers up here are the starting 
channel to look at and the number of channels to look at. So we're looking at 0 and 1. So we can say, show me 8. And uh, you can already see my voice on channel 2. And uh, if I had a second microphone connected, it would be on channel 3. Um, so we, we are able to play signal to channel 2 and 3 and 4. So we have all of these buses here. These are what we're looking at is the waveform information on audio buses. So let's let's actually talk about these buses. So a, what a bus is, generally speaking, it's, it's a, a location to which audio can be written and from which audio can be read. It's a concept which is not unique to SuperCollider. You'll see it in pretty much every DAW and other audio programming languages. Uh, generally speaking, it's a way for us to pass signal from place to place. If you want to have some signal chain, a very common way to do that is to allocate a bus, write signal to that bus, and then have some other process read from that bus, and then maybe continue the chain. You can have buses sort of in parallel, buses in series. It's all very convenient. When we boot SuperCollider, this um, may change in future versions. It's been different in, in previous versions, but uh, we have some number of audio buses that are already created for us. So if we evaluate s.options.num audio bus channels, we see 1,024. So we're only looking at eight, but there's a total of 1,024 audio buses out there for us to use. And uh, by convention, uh, the first two of these 1,024 buses are designated as hardware output buses. That means any signal written to these buses will play out of our sound card or audio interface and will, you know, become sound. And there's uh, also two input bus channels, by convention also two. And, um, you know, so these, the output buses, these have indices 0 and 1, so that's why they're at the top here, 0 and 1. Uh, and then 2 and 3 are associated with hardware inputs, and so my microphone is connected to the first input on my interface. That's why it's showing up here on bus 2. Um, and if I had another microphone, it would show up on bus 3. And then the rest of the buses with indices 4, 5, 6, etc., all the way up to 1,023, are what are called private buses. Uh, what is this again? Num private audio bus channels. Right? So that's just everything that's left. As you can see, the number is 1,020. And the, the term private in this case just means not associated with hardware. So they, they exist, they work the same way. It's just that playing audio to one of these buses will not go to hardware. You'll need to actually have some other process to read it from that bus and then eventually send it to, to speakers. Um, so, let's see, as, as an, why don't we, um, let's see, there's just so many interconnected pieces to talk about here. So, I uh, just wanna make sure I don't miss anything important. Let's, let's go ahead and just make, uh, we'll introduce um, the counterpart to out, which is in, and we'll pass signal from one synth to the next. So uh, we have our, we'll call this a uh, source because it just plays a sine wave and sends it out to a bus. And we'll make another synth def called echo. And this one's gonna be a bit different. Uh, SIG is going to be a signal acquired by reading from a bus. And in needs two things. It needs to know the index of the bus to read from and the number of channels to read. So um, a quick sidebar here. In SuperCollider, there really is no such thing as a multi-channel bus. This is a little bit different. There's some, some software which, you, like bus, a bus has an index, and then that index can have any number of channels. But in SuperCollider, every bus is one channel. So if we, for example, say, um, let's read from bus 19, and I want to read two channels, it is going to read from 19 and 20. 
So it's just to be perfectly clear here, you know, we, uh, this, it, it sort of looks like we're reading from bus 19 and two channels of audio, but it's actually 19 and the next bus, which is 20, right? And then we're going to say, uh, you know, we don't even really need the separate variable here. We're just going to say sig equals um, sig plus We're just going to add to that signal a, a delay processed version of that signal. And then we're going to send that out to a bus. You know, we probably should say in.ir, you know, 19. Give it a default value here. And since we're reading two channels, we should make sure that the source signal is also two channels. You want to make sure that your channel size and bus sizes are consistent. So something like this will turn this into a two-channel signal. OK. Let's see if I forgot anything here. So what we'll do first is uh, create the echo synth. And we don't really have to do anything here. We can just leave it as is. But just to be extra clear, I think it's always good to say the input bus is going to be 19 and the output bus is going to be 0. OK? So there we go. We've created that synth. Oh, we have a bunch of stuff here. I don't know. I, you know what? It's because I forgot to change this to the done action too. <laughs> so command period. Try this again. There we go. So now we have our echo synth on the server. It is reading from uh, bus 19, which we can't see right now. We'll, we'll deal with that in just a second. And it's writing to bus 0. Now, right now, there's nothing writing to bus 19. So we don't hear anything. Right? But all we have to do now is create another synth called source. We're going to say, I would like you to write to bus 19. And let's, let's go look at bus 19. So now we're looking at 19 and 20. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. And so notice that there's no delayed signal on these buses. We're just writing the dry, you know, purely generated signal to these two buses, 19 and 20. And this process, this echo synth, is reading from those buses and is writing to bus zero. It reads, reads those two channels in, does its signal processing magic, whatever that happens to be, and then writes it out. So if we go back to uh, zero and two, there's the process signal. We can actually see the whole thing if we want to. Uh, I think I need 21 tracks here. Right. Should do a random frequency here. Music. Okay. Uh, right. Good. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Generally makes sense. Right. Okay. So what I'd like to introduce next is uh, related to the fact that. Doing things like this, you know, bus 19 is not ideal. Like, where did I come up with this number from? I just chose it randomly. And if we're dealing with lots of buses, you don't, you don't want to have to remember 19 was for that and 27 was for, no, it's, that's, so we don't want to do that. So uh, what we can do is, is use the bus class. So there's a, there's a class called bus, which basically attempts to remove the burden of like dealing with, you know, numbered indices. Uh, so what we can do, um, we'll, just get rid of everything for a second. And we'll say b equals bus.audio. And this is how we, we use the bus class to allocate. I'm putting scare quotes around allocate because we're not technically allocating a bus. We're just creating a reference to a bus that already exists. It needs to know the server on which the bus exists. So this is the same as like loading a buffer. 
it's always going to be lowercase s, and then the number of channels. And we've been working with a stereo bus, two, two bus channels, so we're going to say two, and we run that. And look down here, it tells us that it has allocated an audio bus. The lowest index is four, and it's two channels. And the reason it shows four is because that is the first available, the lowest numbered available private bus, because zero and one are for output speakers, right? Two and three are for input microphones, and then four. Four is not being used, so it says, great, here's four and five, and it's called lowercase b, and now you can use it however you want. So now we can uh, take these lines of code again, and we'll say read from bus b, and go out to zero, and this one is playing to bus b. So we create our echo effect, and now you see it's on four and five up here. And then if we wanted another bus, um, we'll just call it C because I'm not feeling creative today. Uh, you can see that C, uh, because we've asked for two channels, it says, well, I know that four and five were already claimed, so I'm going to give you six and seven. So, so the bus class kind of takes care of all this for you. Um, what you don't want to do is rerun this code because even though it has the same name, uh, it's, it says, well, okay, uh, you already, uh, it doesn't, it has, you know, the bus, the, the mechanism here is not aware of our variable naming scheme. So even if it has the same name, it's not smart enough to be like, oh, okay, well, I better reuse the same buses. So um, if you accidentally do this, you know, eventually you'll run out of buses. Um, I mean, there, we already know how many there are. There are, um, you know, 1,020 private buses. Um, so if you want to reset the allocation counter, you can do uh, s dot new bus allocators. Sorry, there we go. And this running this line of code just tells the uh, language just forget about all the buses that the user has requested. Just reset. And so now when we do b again, we're back at four. Um, so if you run both of these lines together again and again and again, you'll never run out of buses because we reset the counter first, and then we say, give me the first available private bus, and we've gone back to four, right? So that, and you know, we can give this a much more meaningful name than B. We can say like two delay or something like that. You might say, you know. And so then we can say the input is, uh, maybe there's a more sensible naming scheme. We could just call it delay bus. Some, the, the input is whatever's being written to the delay bus, and this synth is going out to the delay bus. Right? Simple. The name is totally up to you. And uh, make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so we've kind of already covered uh, input output UGENs. But while we're here, let's talk briefly about microphone signals. This is a very common thing to want to do is you have a microphone plugged in, you want to get it into Super Collider and mess around with it. And so we already know that the input signal from my voice is on channel two. Um, so one thing we can do is uh, we'll just um, uh, see, well, why don't, why don't we just uh, make this echo effect and make another synth that's called mic. And sig is going to be, uh, actually, let's start with in. So we say read from bus two, or do this if you want. And just one channel, because it's just one microphone. All right, no, no point in saying two channels. And then we'll say send this out to some bus, uh, and let's scale it down so it's a little bit quieter. And you know we still have our two delay bus. This hasn't gone anywhere. Pressing command period, or I think even quitting the server does not interfere with this bus allocation process. So, you know, the really uh, allocating buses is something you basically just need to do once at the beginning of your project or session or whatever. So what we can do now 
is uh, copy this echo effect and we'll uh, you, oh you know what this I what I should do is uh, make this two channels because it's just one mic but then we, we're going to be sending it to a two channel bus so we should basically copy that one channel to a second channel so there's our mic synth we'll create our delay effect and now we're going to create a mic synth making sure to send it to the delay bus and so what I'm about to do is a little bit dangerous because I'm going to be taking the microphone signal which is clipped onto my <laughs> collar here and passing it to a delay effect and then that's going to send it out to speakers so I'm prepared to press command period very frantically but as soon as I uh, run we have two echoes for some reason I guess I just uh, probably didn't get rid of the first one so now when I run this we should hear an echo on my voice hello, 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 hello. yeah it's working and command period and we'll say this a little bit louder and we have an echo on my voice in space okay so we'll command period on that probably should have given this a name you know so it's easier to free it and from here the possibilities are you know it's, it's one thing to keep in mind is the fact that we're using a signal from a microphone doesn't really change anything an audio signal is an audio signal. It can come from an oscillator, come from a noise generator, come from a sample playback eugen, come from an effect, come from a microphone, come from anywhere, right? So you can do all the same things to a microphone signal that you can do to any signal. And um, all right. And uh, oh, so uh, this this is you know fine, but if you, for example, are you know, using a, working in a different studio with a different audio interface, um, you might like want to configure the Super Collider audio server to have the same number of physical inputs and outputs that are in the studio. Like if you're working in one of the studios here that has eight channels, you'll probably want to set the uh, number of hardware output buses to be eight. And if you have like four microphones, you'd want to set that to be four. So briefly, as this is in the book, I'll do it very quickly here, but uh, you say s.options.num output bus channels equals 8 and input bus channels equals 4. So we can run this code to uh, basically register that change. But the changes will, any changes made with s.options don't take effect until the server is rebooted. So we'll reboot and close the meters. And now once we reopen them, you can see that that change has taken effect. And so now buses 0 through 7 correspond to hardware outputs, and 8, 9, 10, 11 are inputs. So this in.ar2 is not really correct anymore. Oh, and I should add, just like if you're working on headphones or something, this is not going to magically make you be able to do eight channels with headphones. right? It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's assumed that this is going to match your sound card, and you're going to have eight physical channels going out to eight physical speakers. So, but this is how you configure the server when that is the case for you. Um, so a better option than using in is to use sound in. And uh, what sound in needs is um, a bus, and then it also has mullen as. So it doesn't have the num channels thing. The, what's different about sound in, if we look at the source code very briefly, is when you use sound in.ar, what's actually being returned is an instance of in, depending on a few different conditions. But all of the bus values for in, is, it's whatever you provide for the bus, plus something called channel offset, channel offset, channel offset. And channel offset is just the number of output buses. So you basically with sound in, you say zero, and it will automatically figure out the correct bus index that corresponds to the first input audio bus. Right? So if you have, for example, eight uh, hardware outputs, then oh, that, that isn't going to return anything. But if we say um, s.options.num output bus channels, we know that's eight. So nine is what we want. 
but soundin.ar, you just always tell it zero, and that's always going to be the lowest input channel. So whether it's two or nine, doesn't, you don't have to think about it. So we can just say zero and just look at our physical microphone inputs on our interface and say, okay, we're going into the zeroth channel there. So, so all we need to do is just something like this. And so this should, this should work just as well. And yeah, 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 our echo yeah, effect yeah, yeah, still working. Still working. Slightly preferable to um, you know having to do the addition yourself. All right, I want to go back to let's see our source and echo. A couple a couple things we need to keep in mind here. Uh, so we're going to talk now about order of execution. And in this context, order of execution refers to the order in which a collection of discrete synthesis processes are calculated on the server. So let me, I'm going to make a few changes because I want, I want this to be continuous. I want this to be some sort of continuous sound that we can just turn on and let it, let it run. Uh, so what I will do is um, I'll just change the frequency of the sine oscillator uh, to be a noise generator. Uh, let's see. And uh, we'll make this like a slightly different uh, rate. So this should MIDI CPS, sorry. MIDI CPS. So we're just doing a sample and hold, a two-channel sample and hold. Each one ranges between MIDI notes 48 and 85, uh, 45 and 85, converted to cycles per second. And we no longer need this envelope, although maybe it would be nice to say, uh, we'll do like a little ADSR envelope. And we need to provide the done action and the gate. And I'm going to, you know, the, the default value that we put in here, it doesn't really matter because my, my attitude is we're always going to be specifying it when we call the synth. This, this, uh, this really, this is just a placeholder. Who knows what this is actually going to be? So you could even put zero. It really doesn't matter. Right? You should get in the habit of always specifying input and output buses when you call a synth. Uh, and... Okay, so let's just see if some things are working here by taking these, bring them down here. So uh, do we still have our two delay? Great, okay. So we'll do that, and we don't need this. Uh, call this X. <laughs> Alien communications in space. Uh, okay, so that's that's all fine, right? Uh, we have our echo effect. We have our source effect. I'm going to call this. I'm going to give these more meaningful names. So we we uh, basically command period, run this, run this, run this, and then of course we can create it again, and that effect is just kind of sitting there, just taking whatever comes into its input bus and processing it. And then when we're done, we can just free it. All right, watch what happens if we do this in the wrong order. Okay, we'll, we'll make the source sound. So it's playing. Uh, in, in fact, we can look at the, uh, not that, but this. Right, it's making its sound on bus four and five. And now we'll make the echo effect. Right. We hold on. We have we have both of those synthesis nodes, and this one where's where's our sound? Right. This is like uh, this is one of those things where if you're not expecting it, it is completely confounding. Uh, but if we just do this in the opposite order, right, we make our echo. There it is. Make our source, and everything's fine. Okay. So this is order of execution, and this localhost node tree 
is a visualization of all of the uh, nodes, as they're called, that exist on the server right now. It's a real-time you know, update. So when you add things, they'll appear. Uh, this scope here actually creates a little node here below the, the group here. We can close that. OK, so the bottom line of order of execution is that when you put a bunch of synths on the server, they are calculated from head to tail. In other words, top to bottom. Uh, and uh, so if and and the um, so if we make this effect, there it is on the server, and then if we make this source, it appears above. And source and then echo. And if we do it in the opposite order, like this and then this, they are in the opposite order. Right. So this is this is kind of the default behavior of how of what happens when you create a synth if we don't specify otherwise. And so let me, let me explain to you, I'm, I'm going to draw a little picture, which I've drawn in previous classes to kind of explain what's going on. So we have the server, which I'm going to draw as this box. Okay, so this is the server. And here's the head, and here's the tail. Okay, so we might have a bunch of things, and synths are always going to exist on the server from you know in a in an in a linked list in a, in an order right you can never have two synths side by side they always are in a one dimensional order um, and you know we, the the node tree draws these um, you know directly on this box but i'm going to i'm going to put them over to the side and i'm going to draw buses on the server now i th i like to think of buses as like these little um, signal paths, right? Little, like there's a bunch of buses. I'm just going to draw a few of them. Of course, there's 1,024 of these, etc., all the way up to, and so this is bus 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, dot, 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 1023, right? All of our audio buses. And uh, yeah, I like that you can also think of these as like um, like a metro subway map or something like that. Um, maybe I'm just saying that because it's called a bus. I don't know. But let's say we put, uh, okay, so we know that these 0 and 1 automatically go to our speakers. So anything written to 0 goes to the speaker, right? And, and we also have uh, microphones going in. To two and three, and they kind of look like maracas. But they are they are microphones, and so let's say we put uh, our source synth up here at the at the head of the node tree. Its job is to write signal to buses four and five, and because it's at the head of the node tree, it's calculated first. So that signal gets created and put on its little four and five tracks, and then we have our delay effect whose job it is to read from buses four and five and write to zero and one. Mm -hmm. So this is the right order. If we have two processes called A and B, and the output of A is supposed to be the input of B, then A must be closer to the head of the, the node tree than B. They have to be in that order. I'm going to undo and then show you the problem when we do this in the wrong order. Uh, okay, we'll just say, if, if there's very limited undo steps in this program, so we'll just cross that out. So if, we, if the effects is first, its job is to say, okay, well, I'm going to read um, what's on 4 and 5, whatever that is, and delay it, put that delay effect on it, and write it to 0 and 1. And then the source's job is to write to 4 and 5. And the, a key piece of information here is that um, you know, audio is processed in blocks, blocks of samples. By default, 64 samples at a time. That's called one control block. And so on every control block, which is a very, very short period of time, just 64 samples, SuperCollider goes head to tail and calculates all of the synths. And then, you know, and then it clears all of those audio buses. It wipes them all clean 
and starts again with the next control block, the next 64 samples, and does it again and again and again. So at the beginning of a control block, all these buses are empty. And uh, the, um, so four and five have nothing on them. So the effect, which is at the head, reads silence and delays silence and writes silence, delayed silence to buses zero and one. So we hear nothing. And then before the control block is over, the source synth reads, oh, sorry, writes its signal to four and five, which, you know, does not go to speakers, so is not heard. And, uh, and then that control block ends, we wipe all the buses clean, and the process begins again. So this, this is why the wrong order fails, because there's a critical miscommunication between these two synths. So uh, you, the user, have to make sure that, you know, processes which feed effects are uh, to the head of the node tree relative to processes which process those signals. Does that make sense? All right. So that's, that's what you have to do. And then here I'll try to sort of explain some of the tools that are available for um, making your life easier in doing that. So first of all, let's talk about groups. A group is uh, very closely related to synths. They are two subclasses of a parent class called uh, node. And a node just represents an entity on the server. It might be a synth, might be a group. So groups don't actually generate any signal or process any signal. They're just containers that help you organize synths. Um, let's, let's go ahead and make one. Um, we'll say uh, source group. And I'm going to do this so we can see what we're doing. So we're just going to make a new... Actually, we'll make, the, we'll make the effects group first. Here we go, we've made a group. See, there it is. And source group. Let's make that one. And you can tell by the numbers that, you know, the, just like with the synths, when we make something new, the default behavior is to just go to the top of this larger containing group called the default group. Right? And so now, uh, if we make a synth, we don't have to worry about the order in which these two things are created as long as they get put in the correct groups. And when we've been creating synths, the, we've only been specifying two things, the name of the synth def and an array containing a bunch of argument values. But there's more. So uh, after that array, there are two more things, something called target and something called add action. Uh, so I'll try to explain this piece by piece. The target is some entity on the server. It could be another synth, it could be a group, it could be uh, the server itself. Um, but we're just gonna say um, source group. So this synth's target is source group, which is this one here. And there it is. And this one's target will be the effects group. <laughs> And I, I, the reason it, it sort of clicked when we started, and that's because I, this was already playing, and then suddenly we, you know, complete the chain by dropping a processing effect, and, you know, this, this one's already playing, so it's going to be kind of sudden. So even though, you know, we can create these two synths in any order now, because they're being put in groups that are already in the correct order, it still sort of makes sense to you know, put, put all the effects in place first, and then make the sound. Like if we had a, if we had a long fade in on this sound, you know, we want to hear the whole thing. So, uh, all right. Uh, let's see, so we can, uh, I'm going to go ahead and free that. And you can free groups too. You can just say fx group.free, and that goes away. Source group dot free. I'm just starting over with the uh, basics here. Okay, so let's let's talk uh, add actions. Forget about the groups. And uh, if if we don't specify a target. Uh, then the default target is the default group on the default server. 
So there's always this default group. It's this gray thing here. And the default add action is uh, a symbol uh, named add to head. That's, that's one of five add actions. Let's see if I can find add actions. Uh, ah, I think I just saw it. So this is the synth help file. Here are the five add actions. Add to head. This assumes the target is a group, and it's going to go at the top of that group. Add to tail. It's kind of the opposite. It goes to the bottom of its group target. Add after. We'll put a, put a synth immediately after the target. Before, immediately before. And add replace will replace the target. <clears throat> I pretty much never use this one. But maybe there's a reason you'd use it. So I'm going to go ahead and specify um, nothing for the target and go straight to add action. And we'll say, or actually, you know what? We're going to do it this way. I'm going to make uh, our synth, our, our FX synth. Right? And so we know if we just run this line as is, it's going to use the default target and the default add action, which is add to the head of the default group. That's not what we want. Yes, it is what we want. I got confused for a second. It is what we want because um, uh, that's, that's the correct order. So let's add the source first. And if we do this now, that's the wrong order. So what we can do is say, create the source. And then the add action is going to be add to tail. And that will go to the tail of the default group. So that's good. Another option is to say uh, create the source. And then say uh, the target is going to be the source synth. And the add action here is add after. So it's going to say, now uh, this little thing is my target, and I'm going to be I'm going to put myself right after. Uh, oh, okay. You know what? I need to use keywords. That's my problem. So command period. Here, I'll space this out so it's a little bit easier to read. So we have synthf name, array of arguments, the target, and the add action. So we create the source, and then we the fx synth targets the source synth and goes right after it. So there are many ways to get the correct order. These add actions and targets give you lots of options, and you know they're pretty much all equivalent, I suppose. Uh, as a general rule. Uh, it's a good idea to have all of your signal processing effects awake and active and ready and listening and in place, and then start creating generative synths uh, and specifying the correct bus and putting them to, towards the head of the node tree so that they're above the, uh, the processing synths, and then you're pretty much good to go. There is a, a figure in Chapter 6 uh, that's linked on the course website, which it's like a sort of kind of spider web thing, or like a, like a flow chart, basically, where uh, uh, basically I'm starting with uh, the default group and a single synth. And then I give you an example of adding a new synth with a variety of combinations of targets and add actions, so you can see what the node tree looks like after each one of those, just to kind of conceptualize that. Uh, and then, okay, one, one more thing, if I can squeeze one more thing in here. Uh, one thing we've been glossing over is options for mixing dry and wet. Because what, what, what we're doing right now is the, this is like, what we've done here with our echo effect is just like lock our dry wet balance at 50%. Because we're just like adding them together. Okay. So there are, uh, 
you know, if, if you want, the thing we've been doing so far is basically like uh, putting an insert effect on a track in a DAW because there's a single output and it goes into a single input. Um, so let me just show you a, a very quick, my, my sort of preferred option for um, dry wet mixing here. Um, so we have our source. We're not going to mess with that because that's our source. Uh, what we're going to do here is uh, sig.blend. So blend is just a convenience method which invokes some other ugen, which I think it's like an xfade, xfade ugen. It's either like there's this unit generator, which is an equal power two channel crossfade. It lets you mix A and B. It's very simple. You can also use this, but I, I like to use blend. So blend takes two things, which is the other signal with which to blend, and then a, a blend fraction. 0.5 is 50%, 1 is entirely wet, and 0 is entirely dry. So we're just going to say, uh, we'll say fx, fx equals whatever it was. I'll just copy it from, from up here. Um, and then we're going to say blend this with fx, and we'll say mix.kr, 0.5. And this, this should be sufficient in many cases uh, in allowing you to arbitrarily control the balance of the processed and unprocessed signal and you know, bypassing it uh, if, if desired. Right, so let's go ahead and make a couple of groups. We'll say source group. And to make the effects group, we can use a, a different method for creation. We can say after. This says create the effects group well, I have to, there's an echo synth on the, I'm just being really careless with my leftover synth. So we make the group, and then this says make a new group called effects group and put it after the source group. And then we'll grab these. Uh, put this in the source group. Uh, and put this in the effects group. Uh, okay, so that goes there. And I'm going to set the mix to be zero. And so when we create this, did I give myself? Yeah, I did. Let me make it a little quieter. Uh, when I create this, we should hear no effect. But then we can set the mix. And so now we're only hearing the output of uh, the comb filter. And we can slowly turn that down. Our groups too, I guess. Uh, oh, you, um, another thing you can do is uh, s. You've probably seen this already. S. Free all. That just takes everything off the server, and then you know, w with the exception of the default group. Uh, oh, here, here's something else fun that we can do. Let's make this echo synth again. Set the mix to be I don't know 0.3, and we can make um, a bunch of these synths. I'm just gonna not even give them names. Oh, you know what? We don't have our groups. <laughs> That's why. Yeah, make our groups. Okay. All right, lots of source sounds. They're all getting written to the same bus. They all get mixed together and they're all being simultaneously processed. Now, we didn't give these names, so how do we get rid of them? Uh, you know, the, we can't say like gate zero to each one, but we can say source group dot set. And when we do something like this, the set message is relayed to everything inside of the group. And if some of those things are groups, it gets relayed to whatever's in those groups. So it's like, you know, just, so that just turns everything off. So this is, this is the kind of the big convenience of groups is that you can talk to many synths simultaneously by just talking to the group. So that pretty much summarizes uh, sections 6.1 and 6.2 of chapter six. 
which is basically buses, input and output, uh, order of execution, groups, targets, add actions. And then the rest of chapter six goes into details about, like specific details about delay effects and building delay effects, uh, reverb effects. There's a, some companion codes that do like harmonizer effects and then there's some live granular synthesis. And all of those are you know, interesting and worth reading, but, the, you know, but they're all built on these, these ideas of just being able to place generators and processors on the, sig on the server you know, in the right order and be able to pass signal with buses and make sure everything is constructed correctly. So uh, there, you have another week on your sequencing homework, so that'll be due next week. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there, I guess. Do you have any questions? If you do, you can stick around afterwards, but um, we'll call it a week, okay? Thank you.